Um, kids, you're going to stay in the service with us, but I know that Emily has some activity bags at the back. So parents, if you want to go or if you want to send your kids, um, if they just need something to, to keep them busy, um, there are bags at the back. And so please take advantage of that. Um, so yeah, there's no kids zone uh, today. And then also next week, we're all going to be outside, so there won't be any kids zone. But I think we're going to have chalk and stuff for the kids to do outside as well. So if you want to grab a Bible, I'll encourage you to do that. We're going to be in two primary passages today. We're going to kind of flip between John chapter 12, but also Acts chapter 13. So if you want to have kind of both of those passages ready, that would be uh, great. And then you can follow along with me in uh, your Bibles. Um, I remember in school, I don't remember a lot about school, (laughs) but I remember in school... In one of my uh, math classes early on, so in like the primary school days, uh, I remember our teacher gave us this word problem or some kind of iteration of it. It might not be exactly this, but I remember this type of word problem that our teacher gave us. And the question was posed like this, and maybe you had a similar uh, memory, but she said, would you rather have $10,000 a day for 30 days, or, so that's option one, or would you rather have a penny doubled every day for 30 days, right? So day one, you have a penny. Day two, you have two pennies, and then four, and then eight, just doubled every day. And so she just kind of threw that out. Which one do you think you would prefer, $10,000 a day for 30 days or a penny doubled for 30 days? And so right away, my brain was thinking, man, $10,000 is a lot of money. And each and every day, someone just gave me ten grand, and you could do whatever you wanted with it. And I, I think, if I remember correctly, the gut reaction of every student in the class was like, well, instant gratification, ten grand, obviously. $10,000 every day, right? And if you just do a quick math, after 30 days, that's $300,000, like grade five or whatever it was, Andrew couldn't even wrap his mind around that kind of money, $300,000 after a month. But if you actually, and this is what the teacher wanted us to do, if you actually sit down and do the math, $10,000 a day for 30 days, right, added 10,000, 10,000 is $300,000, but a penny doubled every day for 30 days is $5,368,709 and 12 cents. And I remember, right, my mind being blown <laughs> by going, well, what? A penny doubled every, because even after the first week, it's like nothing. And you go, well, how can that be? And actually, this week in my office, I sat down and I did the math to make sure. I'm like, was my teacher full of it? And it actually, it's true. I went, wow, that is a lot of Money And I remember that our teacher was using that to kind of illustrate the difference between addition and multiplication. Because early on, addition is far more gratifying. $10,000 a day? Sure. A penny? Double, right? But the power of multiplication. So this is week two of our two-week, you know, little mini-series that we're doing. Reminding ourselves, what is our mission and our vision as a church? Like, basically, why do we exist as a church? What is God calling us to? Why, why do we do what we do? And so last week, we talked about our mission of making disciples. And really, we unpacked, well, what does it actually mean to be a disciple of Jesus? And we talked about that a disciple is someone who follows Jesus and someone who's, you know, actively being changed by Jesus and then is on mission, is committed to the mission that Jesus had, which was to go and make disciples. And then we just talked practically, right? We, we tried to take away some of the, the um, kind of the, the scary, nebulous, oh man, I couldn't make disciples. It's this big, scary thing out there. And we tried to go, okay, well, just practically, what would it look like maybe if families discipled their kids, if you just one-on-one with someone, right? As a church, what would it look like if we were committed to making disciples, And the mission of a church, and I I said this last week, the mission is the what, what do we want to do, but a vision is the how. How are we actually going to go about accomplishing 
the mission. And so our vision as a church, if you were really to boil it down into one word, our vision is multipli- blech, multiplication, not speaking English. Uh, multiplication. We want to be a multiplying church in order to reach people with the gospel. And even just think about the math problem that you know I, I started with. That it proves multiplication beats addition every single time. Every single time. It doesn't matter. Even, even like to take that little word problem and put it into the context of a church. Like what if someone came to us and said, hey, I have this program that you can run at your church that guarantees, it's been proven, guarantees if you run this program in your church, you will add a thousand new people every year to your church. I mean, we would jump all over that, wouldn't we? We would go, wow, every year. So like in 10 years, we'd have 10,000 people in our church. But you know what would be far more effective than that? If every one of the, let's just say 200 people that come to this church or whatever it is. If every year you went out and made a disciple who then they made a disciple and then they made a disciple, that would be exponentially greater church growth. Right? But, do you, so, but the aspect of our vision as a church to multiply is hard because addition feels more gratifying in the short term. Addition feels far more gratifying. I remember even when, when we first came uh, to Fort St. John, that's seven years ago now, and by God's grace and by His Spirit, the, the church began to grow, and it, and it was really exciting. People, we were adding people, and I remember early on, there was all of this talk about like, oh man, this is so exciting. We were at one service then, and we said, wow, we're going to have to build a balcony, and someone, I remember, was in here like, okay, so if we had a staircase, we could build a balcony and fit more people, or there was talk, we got to blow out that wall, and then we can add more chairs, because look, we're growing, and we're adding people, that's great, but do you know what we decided to do instead? Let's go to two services. Let's multiply instead, but in the short term, I agree Adding feels far more gratifying because you go to two services and we kind of felt, well, we feel empty again. It's, it's like there's lots of room now. It doesn't have that same feeling of being crammed in here. And some people don't like that, but some people love the big, like we're, we're just barely fitting in here. And it's far more gratifying to, hey, we had to knock down walls to fit people in here and we're cramming in, but, but multiplying is actually thinking long-term kingdom growth. So our vision as a church, you know, six years ago, the, the elders and pastors, we sat down and said, okay, God, what do you want us to do? Our vision as a church is to multiply. And we identified, you know, four kind of main areas to start with, to multiply through life groups. So we have life groups that meet uh, throughout the week. And, and really, we're hoping that these life groups, that's kind of your that's your church, right? That's, those are your people who, who come and see you in the hospital and bring you meals when you're sick and take care of your kids and stuff like that. That's your church, these little mini churches that meet throughout the city. But the vision was, well, what if they, instead of just, hey, we're going to be a closed group that stays together for 20 years, and there's nothing wrong with that, but what if this group, this life group just said, hey, we're going to start training leaders and then we're going to send them out, multiply to start more groups. And it's really uh, neat that over the years, several life groups have started to, to do this. We're going to train up someone, and then we're going to send that couple out to go start a new life group. But it's hard because, I mean, our life group did this early on, and, and you're sending a couple out, and it's kind of like, we're going to miss, we like having you in our group, but we're going to send you out. So we wanted to multiply through life groups. We want to multiply through our our, our gatherings, being willing to do multiple services to make room so that people can hear the gospel. We want to multiply through sending missionaries, raising up people. Hey, who, who has that calling to go uh, overseas or wherever to go and do full-time missionary work as a job? And then lastly, we wanted to multiply through planting churches. So this morning... I want to specifically focus on the risk and the sacrifice that is involved in following Jesus and in multiplying. I, I, we could talk about 
uh, the biblical mandate to multiply uh, and look at scriptural examples of, of people that were sent out and churches planting churches and multiplying because it's all in there. And we've looked at that in years past. We could walk through each section of these four areas that we want to multiply in and unpack that. But I think the, the more I thought about it, I think we need to talk about this idea of actually sacrifice and risk when it comes to following and obeying Jesus. So here's what's interesting about North American Christianity. Um, I've been thinking a lot about this, and I've talked with a lot of different people about this. I mean, I've been in church ministry, pastoral ministry, for 15 years, and I can tell you two things that I've seen, and I think they're, they're actually connected. I think, number one, we fall into this trap in North America that we just kind of assume that everything's going good. I mean, even think about us as a church. I mean, we've got money in the bank. Literally, we have money sitting in the bank. We're not scrambling to meet a budget. We've got people coming. The lights are on. The bills are paid. The heat is on. And I think the danger is that we can just meet week after week after week after week in relative ease. Right? And I know COVID just kind of threw a wrench into that, and I'm actually grateful for that. It kind of shook us up a little bit. But really, for the last year, we can just meet with relative ease, and then we think about the mission of Jesus, and we think about planting churches and multiplying. And I have often heard, right, throughout the years, well, is there really a need for that, though? Right? Does Fort St. John actually need more churches? We've got lots of churches. Right? You've seen the sign that you can't read when you come into town that lists all the churches and it's all scratched and you have no idea what it says. But it seems like a pretty big sign, right? And I've heard that. We have lots of churches, right? Why do we need more? Even recently, that question, does, does Dawson really need another church? Don't they have lots of, why are we even talking about that? And, and the attitude is kind of like, well, that seems like a lot of work. Or that's, that's too much money to do. Or, or that actually costs us something and i've even heard well what do we get out of it of being involved in in planting a church what do we actually get out of that so i think there's that kind of mindset because our following of jesus in north america and this is a blanket statement but it's never really cost us anything and we've gotten into this idea that being a follower of jesus means being really nice and showing up to church, and then just kind of like living, like living like everybody else. And if we aren't careful, then we can slip into this apathy where years go by and, and churches don't really do much. And, and then bring it down to your level, then followers of Jesus don't really do much. I mean, I had breakfast with a guy on Tuesday, and I said, you know what? I've lived uh, uh, 30, almost 35 years in Canada. Um, I have never once been persecuted for following Jesus. Not once. And yeah, okay, so in, in high school, they, oh, there's the Christian boy that doesn't swear. Oh, boo-hoo, I had to go. I have never once been persecuted for being a follower of Jesus in my life. And so it, if, if you're not careful, then you just kind of slip into this comfortable apathy. Now on the flip side, so that goes on, I think, a lot of us fall into apathy, but I also know from talking with lots of people over the years, and myself included, I know that many people are sitting in church bored. Because we have a sense that we're supposed to be doing something that matters, but maybe we don't know quite what it is. And we hear Jesus talking to his disciples about, you know, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell aren't going to prevail against it. it. And it doesn't seem that dramatic when we pull into the parking lot each Sunday, right? And we go, well, that's what Jesus said, but I'm just, I'm just kind of bored. And I mean, I did youth ministry for eight years and I heard lots of that from teenagers. Our parents tell us that being a Christian is really important, but we're just bored every week. And I want my life to count for something, but really, is this it? So I think there's this, this tension that exists where we can become very comfortable and apathetic and maybe even lazy. I found that in myself 
but then we're also bored going, is this really all there is to following Jesus? When, if you read the Bible and you read about Jesus calling us to this life of sacrifice and there's risks involved, but the reward and the benefits far outweigh any sacrifice you will make. So the first passage I want to look at is John chapter 12. I want us to look at what Jesus said about sacrifice and what it means to follow him. And then we want to look at a real story of what that practically looks like in Acts chapter 13. So John chapter 12, starting in verse 20, um, this is what it says. Now, among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So a couple of interesting things in this passage here. We're told that some Greeks come looking for Jesus. And it's actually unclear whether these are Jewish Greeks or they're non-Jewish Greeks. We're just told that they're Greeks. But clearly, Jesus is starting to become known. And people want to see him. And they come to the, to the disciples and they say, Sir, we, we want to see this Jesus. And so Philip and Andrew go and they tell Jesus. And Jesus' response is really interesting. First off, he says, like he doesn't answer. Sure, you can let them. He says this, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And you go, well, what, what does that mean? Um, the hour that Jesus is talking about is his upcoming death and resurrection. And up until this point, the idea, that idea was always looking um, forward. Even in John chapter 2, Jesus uh, is approached by his mother, right? They're at the wedding in Cana, and his mother comes and says, okay, can you do something about that? And, and Jesus turns water into wine. But when his mother comes and asks him to do something, what does he say? Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Jesus says, my, it's, not my, it's not my time yet. Even in John 7, we're told people were seeking to arrest Jesus, but no one laid a hand on him. Why? Because his hour had not yet come. And so now Jesus is in Jerusalem, and his betrayal, and his arrest, and his trial, and his death are, are now very close. And so Jesus says, uh, my hour has come. It's here like what we've been putting off because of God's sovereignty, okay, it's, it's going to happen now. And then Jesus continues and he says this, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So Jesus tells this very short parable about a seed, right? He says a grain of wheat falls into the earth and it dies. But because it dies, what happens? This grain of wheat dies in the ground, and because of that, it produces much fruit. So it's this image, this idea that's found in nature of new life that comes through death. A seed's death is the germination for life, and that produces a great crop. If farmers never planted their seeds because they didn't want their seeds to die. I don't know why you would do that. But if farmers never planted their seeds because they didn't want their seeds to die, then they would never reap a harvest. Because seeds go into the ground and they die, that is what produces much fruit. And so Jesus is clearly talking about his own impending death. Jesus is going to willingly go to his death. He's going to literally die. He's going to be put into a tomb. And yet his death produced life it brought salvation Jesus willingly died and it produced a harvest of life for those who believe but he's not only talking about himself 
Because Jesus continues, right? He says this, this parable of a seed, it bears much fruit. But then he says in verse 25, he continues, Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. So Jesus now, right, is talking about this idea of loving your life versus being willing to lose your life. And he says, whoever loves his life will lose it, and whoever hates his life in this world. And I want to remind you, Jesus uses strong language to get his point across. We saw last week, Jesus said, unless you hate your mother, brother, sister, father, you can't meet my disciple. He doesn't mean literally we hate them. He just means comparatively, your love for me should be far greater than your love of your family. So even here when Jesus says, whoever hates his life, it doesn't mean that you literally hate yourself and you're self-condemning and you walk around depressed with your head down. No, no, no. Jesus just means, do you love me more than you love your life? Do you love me more than you love anything else? And then Jesus says, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And it ends with, and anyone who serves me, the Father will honor him. So I find this so fascinating. Jesus says, okay, a seed falls into the ground and it dies. But because it dies, it produces life, a harvest, much fruit. And Jesus actually lived this out. He willingly went to his death. He was put in the ground. And out of that came this harvest of souls who received eternal life. And then Jesus says, follow me. Be willing to actually give your life. Be willing to actually lose it. And what does he say? And God the Father will honor you. I think that's massive because this is so often the opposite of what the message is presented as. The gospel is often, unfortunately, presented as, hey, say the prayer Accept Jesus and he will give you your best life now. Wrong. Your best life is eternity. Right? If your best life is now, you're probably going to hell. Because our best life shouldn't be now. We're waiting for our best life, eternity with Jesus. And so in the meantime, we're called over and over and over again to give up your life. For his sake. But so many of us, and I'm, I am preaching to myself, I get sucked into this idea of, man, I just want to love my life now. I want a good, comfortable, easy 80 years if God gives me that. And Jesus says in the word of God, if you love your life now, if you're living for ease and comfort and security and stuff and pleasure now, he, Jesus says, if you love your life you will lose it. But if you give up your life now for the sake of Jesus, for the sake of the gospel, what does Jesus say? You will keep it for all eternity. You will keep it for eternal life. And this is just mind-boggling. If anyone serves me, Jesus says, then God the Father will honor him. Just think about that. If we serve Jesus, God the Father will honor us. See, we have it so backwards. We think, well, following Jesus just means I have a really good, easy life now. Following Jesus means that I am just always healthy. I'm well off, you know, middle, upper class at least. And I have nice stuff and I have lots of friends, and I go to church, and I just live this nice, easy, suburban life, when in reality, the biblical narrative is, if you follow Jesus, yes, you will have unbelievable joy and peace, and you'll have life in your spirit. You'll have literally God dwelling inside of you. God will be with you. That is unbelievable. But Jesus said, if you follow me, um, the world is going to hate you. Jesus says, if you follow me, you're going to be persecuted. You will suffer. Some of you will die. He guarantees us that. I I love that Jesus never sugarcoats it. He says, if you're going to follow me, the world is going to hate you. And if the world loves you, it's probably because you're not following me. But the reward is not for this life. 
the rest that, that we receive is not meant for this life. Right? The reward is when Jesus splits open the sky and comes back and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the rest of my kingdom. You've done good. Now you can rest. I love, right, uh, I think, uh, and Al's here, but he always talks about retirement. Ah, not biblical. You just get retired. You put new tires on and then you just keep going, right? But we live for this like, oh man, I can just relax. The relaxing comes in the new heavens and the new earth. When Jesus says, you've done good. Welcome rest but I want that now and I think if we're honest I just want that now I don't want to go through the the hardship but Jesus says listen the seed has to die to produce life we have to die to ourselves in order to reap a harvest that's how it works and I see this in my own life that struggle that okay I need to die to myself I need to live for eternity. I need to be willing to sacrifice. But I think I see it in churches, even corporately, church lives as well. Collectively, like I said earlier, it's really easy to just pursue comfort and ease. And it's easy, easy to have Sunday services and we're comfortable and there's money in the bank. We've got people coming. The pews are filling up and we can just kind of coast, right? Doing things to reach lost people is hard. It takes work. Even our vision as a church to multiply is hard. It takes work and sacrifice to train people up and to send them out. It takes sacrifice and, and, and pain to train someone in your life group and then, you know, kick them out to go start a new one. I don't want to lose that person. We love them. It takes sacrifices to start new services. It's more work. And now, you know, I won't be able to see everybody on a Sunday. And it takes sacrifice and work to send out ministry, uh, missionaries. We're going to miss them. What if we never see them again? I mean, it takes work and it takes sacrifice to plant churches. It does. Multiplying is hard because in the short term, it feels like a loss. Addition is way more gratifying in the short term. And so I think of our vision, you know, as a church to multiply. And over the last six years that we've been kind of working towards that, there has been. There's been, there's been pushback on just the uncomfortableness of it. And it's natural, right? Because we naturally don't like change. And we naturally, we don't want to sacrifice I mean, I remember thinking back when we first started talking about doing two services on a Sunday and all of the normal, regular pushback happened. Well, we're just going to burn everybody out. It's too much work. Now, and this one got me, now I'm not going to be able to see everybody on a Sunday morning. What if my friend comes to the 9 o'clock and then I come to 11 and then we can't see each other on Sunday? And really what that's saying is, I just like my church life how it is. Stop messing around with it. I don't want to sacrifice. Um, even when we began this discussion of planting a church, those questions came, what is this going to cost? How much, like, are we going to hire another pastor? How much is another pastor's salary? Doesn't Fort St. John and the area, don't they have more churches? This one came up. Well, we tried that years ago and it failed. So why would we do it again? Like, we, like literally, we have this opportunity. I feel like it's being handed to us on a silver platter. Here are keys to a church in Dawson. And the same kind of, same kind of discussion came up. Well, we're going to burn out. Dawson already has enough churches. So we're just going to foot the bill financially for some church in Dawson. How does that benefit us if Andrew is involved in some capacity in the beginning, then we don't get him here. And I get it. But what does Jesus say? If you love your life in this world, you're going to lose it. So what would it look like then, right? And this is the, the, the dreaming part. What would it look like to be a church that said, no, we are willing to sacrifice. We're willing to not settle for the comfortable, easy road. But we said, what can we do with this short time that we have to reach people? And so in Acts 13, we see an example of a church that did exactly this. So if you flip in your Bibles a few pages over to Acts chapter 13... 
right? Jesus has ascended into heaven. Um, Saul has been converted now, and he's a follower of Jesus, and kind of the church is just blowing up in the ancient world. And then you get to Acts chapter 13, and this is what it says in verse 1. Now there were in the church in Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid hands, laid their hands on them and sent them off. So here we have in, in Antioch, this church, and man, if you want to talk about a powerhouse staff at your church, I mean, I, I love our staff, but I would trade any of them for Saul. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but look at who you have. Look at who you have. I mean, you've got Barnabas, the great encourager. You've got, we've got, we've got Mannion, who's a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, well-connected politically, must have had favors from his friend Herod as they grew the church. You've got Saul, right? Like Paul, super evangelist, like amazing apostle. You have this unbelievable team in Antioch. This, I, I, I would have loved to be, this church must have been unreal. Prophets, teachers, Barnabas, well-connected people. You got Saul, and I think with a church like that and with people like that, man, you could do unreal ministry in Antioch. You could build a huge outreach. You could have massive success, but look at what happens. God tells them, I want you to send Barnabas and Saul away. Doesn't even tell them to where. Just set them apart and send them out for the work that I have for them. Humanly speaking, that's insane. Think of the opportunity that this church had in Antioch, and God says, I want you to take your two best guys, and I actually want you to send them away. That would have seemed like a massive loss. Remember, sending away, we love Saul. We love Bar Barnabas, the encourager, we're going to send him away. That would seem like a loss, a sacrifice not worth making. But look at what happened. The church is obedient to God. They fast, they pray. They lay hands on them, and then they send them off. I, I got to say, I, I know that that would be hard. Because I've been a part of ministries where God quite unexpectedly calls people elsewhere. I've been a part of those conversations. And man, it's not fun. It's painful. You go, really? God's calling you somewhere else, but think about what we could do here. And sometimes you question. You ask, why God? Wouldn't it, wouldn't it just be better if Barnabas and Saul stayed here? What if we just hunkered down and we just did ministry here together and God says, no, I have something else for them. So it seems like a loss, but if you continue to read Barnabas and Saul, they're sent off. And we're not going to read all of it, but in chapters 13 and 14 of Acts, you begin to see what happened because the church in Antioch was willing to suffer a hit, willing to suffer loss for the sake of the kingdom. Barnabas and Saul go to Cyprus first, we're told. And they proclaim the word of God in the synagogues there. Then they go to Antioch in Pisidia, a different city named Antioch. And look at what happens. Acts 13, 42. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. What things? The, the gospel. Think about that. The people in that city begged Saul and Barnabas, please come back the next Sabbath and tell us more about this Jesus. Acts 13, 44, the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. Can, can you imagine, can you, um, I, we can't, we can't, ima can you imagine all of Fort St. John, almost everyone coming to hear the gospel. And then in verses 48 and 49, when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. 
Next, Saul and Barnabas, Barnabas go to Iconium. And look at what happens. Acts 14.1. Now at Iconium they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and they spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. And then they go on to Lystra and they go on to these other surrounding areas. And in Acts 14, 21 and 22, it says, When they preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith. And finally, roughly a year and a half later, Saul and Barnabas returned to Antioch and they report everything that God had done. So we look at Acts 13 at the beginning and we go, you guys are fools. Sending away your best two members? Stay in Antioch. Do ministry there. Does Cyprus and Iconium and Lystra, do they really need more churches? What if you burn out, Saul? What if you fail? What if you go and you fail miserably and you have to come back? No, the church in Antioch willingly suffered a loss. They willingly made a sacrifice and look at the fruit that it produced. The whole city hearing the gospel. Many disciples made. Christians strengthened. People literally begging to hear the gospel. A seed goes into the ground and dies and it produces much fruit. A church makes a sacrifice and suffers a short-term loss and the fruit is produced and multiplied. So our vision as a church is multiplication. And I know to be a church that multiplies, it costs us something. It means sacrifice. But I just think, what what if we were like this church in Antioch? Where we said, yeah, you know what? It is going to be sad to send people out because we might lose them. We're not going to see them as much. Yes, it's going to cost us money and effort and sweat. But we are committed to multiplying so that Fort St. John and Dawson and Taylor and Charlie Lake and Hudson Hope and Tumblr, we want people to hear the gospel. It is worth all the effort. It is worth all the sacrifice to know that people are going to meet Jesus. So by way of application, I mean, I thought long and hard, how how do you apply something like this? Because on one hand, my personality is like, okay, well, let's just do this then. (laughs) We're talking about taking risks and sacrificing. Let's just do it. Let's plant that church in Dawson. Let's do it. Let's stop talking about it and let's just do it. And I know, right, we have to talk. And that's why we have people who are a lot wiser than me because I'm like, let's just go next Sunday and do it. Let's multiply But I think really what it comes down to, and this has been my even own personal struggle, do I have an eternal mindset? I think I I can be so guilty, and maybe you can as well, just thinking that I, I just want my life to be comfortable and easy for however long Jesus gives me. But Jesus was so clear in John 12, and I mean, we could look at other passages too about The sacrifice, pick up your cross daily, follow me. Jesus says in John 12, whoever loves his life, you're going to lose it. I have to remind myself that often. If I am just building up my life here so that it's comfortable and easy and I love it, I might be losing my eternal life. Jesus says, if you love your life here, you're going to lose it. But if you hate your life in this world, meaning if you are willing to sacrifice and risk and lay down your life, Jesus says, then you're going to gain eternal life and the Father will honor you. So I think part of the process could be us repenting, just saying, God, forgive us for having this idol of comfort or ease or safety, for not taking advantage of opportunities that God's giving us by, by wanting to play it safe. And then, and then maybe it is just taking small steps of obedience in faith when God begins to open up opportunities for us. To say, okay, God, I, I don't know where this is going to lead. I don't know the outcome in 10 years. But this step of faith has the potential for many people to hear the gospel. So I just want to take that step of obedience. I think even personally, right, any sacrifice that you feel like God's asking you to make, the the blessing that comes from it always outweighs the the cost. 
Whether, it, you know, we, uh, there's been a few times when my wife and I have felt like, okay, by the Spirit's leading, we're supposed to give a financial gift to someone. And right away, my flesh is like, yeah, but that can buy a lot of stuff. Right? And I start to think, yeah, but, you know, your, your, your furnace needs to be fixed. Yeah, but your water heater's going out. Yeah, but, you know, the kids need new shoes. And, and all of these excuses, and I just have to go, no. Okay, God, you are calling us to this. And you give it, and it costs something, but the blessing that comes from it is just so much greater than the cost. Right? I even think, and again, I, I, I always really struggle with sharing personal stories because I don't want it to feel like I'm trying to toot my own horn because, man, oh, man, you know, Paul says I'm the chief of sinners, and sometimes I'm like, are you sure, Paul? I'm pretty sure it's me. <laughs> but but what, even coming here, like seven years ago, we said at first, there's no way we want to go there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and it caught, like, we're away from Molly's family. We see her family once a year, if that. But the, 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 the blessing that came with us just taking, and that's a, such a small example of us just going, okay, God, we're just, we don't know what this is going to be like. We're just going to take this. The blessing that comes from that far, far, far outweighs the cost. And so I want to encourage you. It's hard to have an eternal mindset because we just live day to day with just our eyes fixed on here on the earth. And I don't want to say that it, it doesn't mean it's not hard. It is hard, but obedience to Jesus is always worth it. And God blesses us when we follow him. But it's like this, this constant thing when, when I have to go, I'm not living for the next 50 years. I'm living for the next 8 billion years with Jesus. I'm not living for this momentary blip and then it's gone. I want to live for all of eternity. I want, I want to pass into the new heavens and the new earth and hear Jesus go, oh, well done. Now you can rest. So I don't know what that's going to be for you. Maybe, it, maybe God's been convicting you of a step of obedience that you need to take and you've been pushing it off. Maybe today is the day where you go, okay, God, I'm just going to obey. I don't, know, I don't know what the outcome is, but you were calling me to do this. It's going to cost me something, but Jesus, I'm going to obey you. And so my prayer as we move into this 2021, 2022 season is that as a church, we would say, no, you know what? I'm, we are willing to do things that cost us. We have, we have to do things that, that we make sacrifices for so that more people come to know Jesus, more people go deeper in their faith, so that more baptisms happen, so that more churches are planted, simply because we were willing to die to ourselves in order to bear much fruit. And so I'm just going to allow the Holy Spirit to, to convict you in whatever way that is, and it might be different things that you can begin to kind of take steps of obedience this week. Uh, but my prayer is that would be us, that we would go, yeah, you know what, it does cost. And yeah, you know what, it is painful, but it is so worth it to see men and women and boys and girls come to know Jesus. So, Father, I just thank you for such a clear example in Scripture of a church that uh, was willing to suffer a loss for the greater gain in your kingdom. Uh, and Jesus... Um, we just admit, I mean, I admit, I confess that so often I am living for myself in the here and the now. And yeah, I, I love you, Jesus. But if I'm honest, a lot of times I'm like, but I, I just want my life to be easy. And so God, just forgive us, forgive me. I pray that all of us would be willing to lose our lives for the sake of your kingdom, in whatever that looks like. Be willing to actually take a risk and make a sacrifice and take a step of obedience that will cost us something because our minds are fixed on eternal things. And our mind is fixed on the rest that will come when we pass into glory. God, help us. We need your help because, man, the, the world is shiny and attractive and it distracts us. 
And so help us not to live for the world, but to be willing to take those steps of obedience and sacrifice because our, our minds are so fixed on your kingdom. God, help us as a church to multiply. Help us as a church, and, and whatever that looks like, if that's, maybe there's life group leaders here that just know, yeah, we, we need to train someone and send them out. Maybe it's someone that you're tapping on the shoulder who you're calling into missionary work overseas. Maybe it's, maybe it's people here that want to be involved in planting a church in Dawson. Whatever it is, God, please lead us and guide us by your Holy Spirit that we would just be obedient no matter the cost. Yes, that we would be wise in the decisions we make, but that we wouldn't make excuses because obeying you would be too uncomfortable. That we would go, no, no matter the cost, we will follow Jesus. We will multiply. We will send people out no matter the cost. So God, help us in that. It's it's really easy to say that, but help us to actually begin to take steps of obedience Holy Spirit, I just pray even this week that you would just speak very clearly to each one of us. Maybe there's a, there's a personal area where we've been putting off obeying you because it's going to cost us something. And I just pray that even this week we would, we would obey you, Jesus. God, I, I don't want to spend my life bored in church. And you have called us to so much more than that. And so help us, God, to see the the weight of this and to put skin in the game and to go and obey you and make disciples and multiply Jesus. Help us. And that we wouldn't do it so that North Peace MB gets a name for itself. That we wouldn't do it so that anyone gets a name for themselves, but that we would do it so that in the peace region, Jesus, you would be famous. That you would be made much of. So help us, God, just soften our hearts and change what needs to change so that we would begin to take those steps of obedience. Uh, Thank you, Jesus, that you are the one who builds your church and that we just have to be faithful. We don't have to be clever. We don't have to be come up with amazing new things. All you call us to do is just to be faithful to go, and would we do that? And thank you, Jesus, that you build your church. And so we just pray all of this in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. So that is the end of our service today. Um, If you need prayer, or even if you just want to talk, or or I'm going to just stay up front, I would love to meet with you, pray with you. I think some of our, yeah, Brad's here and John's here, if you want to talk to some of our elders and pray with them. Um, I know even maybe Emily and Christy, if you want to pray with one of them, if you're a a woman and you don't want to pray with a guy, I get that. Um, Maybe they'll be available too. Um, But yeah, thank you for being here. Please come talk to me if you go, yes, I want to be involved somehow, and we'll try and find a way that you can be involved. Thank you for watching online, and uh, we'll see, see you next week.